Hi everyone, my name is Erin Sadler from Sadler Science, and today I'm going to show you how to use this simple template to improve student use and understanding of science vocabulary. This is a really flexible and interactive method that can be adapted to meet the needs of your students. I'm gonna provide you with a lot of examples so you can see how this might work depending on your students' needs. I'm also gonna to link to a blog post below that will further explain the details like why we don't front load vocabulary. So if you have questions about that, feel free to comment below or check out that blog post. And if you haven't already, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. This is a simple vocabulary template that I use with students and it has four basic categories. I used to only have three, but I'll get into that in a second. So the first is a term or part of speech. The second is a definition. The third is the example, or sometimes we put a picture there. And then I added this fourth column because I found that this template didn't capture all of the conversation that was happening in class. So I wanted to add this extra piece. And I leave this open for non-examples, related words, homonyms, sentences, whatever the students are discussing so that we can track that information. I want students to be able to look back at this and remember what we talked about. Also, I'm just going to let you know now that the words that we're going to be using would probably never be found in the same unit unless you had a very creative storyline. But this is reflective of real conversations that I've had with students, and so I know how they would respond when we were interacting with these terms. The first term I picked is condensation. I like using this word as an example because students will throw it out like they totally understand what it means, but then when you press them just a little bit, their definition falls apart. So the way that I would present this word is I would write it on this chart and I would ask them for a definition. Usually students respond by saying that it's the water that's found on the side of a cold drink. So I press them a little further and ask them if this is the only place that we would see condensation. They would probably respond no, so I would move that over to the example section. I really want to use student voice to create our definitions. So that means that we're going to have some editing and moving around and all of that kind of stuff. So that's why I really like to use a document like this because it's editable. I can project this up on the screen and students could watch me as I'm going along. But it's also okay to print something like this out or have them write this in their interactive notebook. Since we've moved this to the example part, I would ask students if they could think of another example of condensation. And they'd probably say something like clouds. We know clouds are related to condensation. So at that point, I put them back to the definition section and I would have them redefine it. And their definition would probably improve just a little bit, but it wouldn't quite be perfect. They'd probably say something like this. Maybe something like water that happens when it's cold or with the cold or something like that, that there's some sort of ca cause and effect relationship with coldness. So I'd ask them, where does this water come from? And I'd get a couple different responses here. Some kids will think that it comes out of the beverage, that it like leaks through the container. And some students will just say that it comes from the air, but not really understand what that means. So at this point, we would stop this activity and we would go and we would do some more work in order to really figure out this definition. There's a lot of different things that we could do. We could do a simulation, we could do a reading, I could just lecture, but that probably wouldn't be very exciting. We could do an investigation, we could do all kinds of things, and then we could come back. Hopefully through this work, we'd come up with a better definition. Here's an example of a definition that students might come up with. Water particles in the air that we can see because they move closer together when it's cold. I like that one because it shows a stronger understanding of what's happening and it's much better than something that I would give them because it's student created so they're really gonna understand this piece. So let me show you a couple of different ways that we can use this other section. And again, this is dependent on your student needs. If you're teaching a class with a lot of emerging multilingual students, then you might want to use this for sentences. For a long time, I was hesitant to include sentences 
in my vocabulary because I felt like students weren't coming up with like great sentences because they were just learning these definitions and they didn't really understand how to use the term. But with students who are learning how to put sentences together in English, this is a really great tool for them. I can give them the sentence frame, I see condensation, and they could say on the side of my glass, in the clouds, when my cup is really cold, they could fill it in in any way and then share it with a neighbor and we can turn this into a speaking activity. That might not work for your students and that's totally okay. So maybe it would look something like this. Maybe at some time during your conversation, a student said, hey, this looks like the word condense and you could talk about the relationship between the word condense and condensation. I recently taught a lesson about landforms and I had a really interesting conversation with students. In this case, I didn't start with the term. I started with the examples. We talked about various landforms in the activities that we'd done previously, so I listed them here in the examples. Then I told them all of these could be called landforms. I asked students that if we were looking at all of these different landforms, how could we create a definition that would encompass all of those things? One of the students responded that a landform is when something makes the land form into a certain shape. This is why I like to include the parts of speech. I told the student that this sounded more verb-like to me and that we we're talking about a noun, that this is a thing. So at the time, we moved this definition over into the other column and then went back to the drawing board. Another student raised their hand and said, it's just a piece of land, that it's just kind of a fancy way to say any random piece of land that exists. And it doesn't matter what type of land it is, that all of those fall under the category of a landform. And so I asked the class, what would make this term different than just calling it land? And they decided that it's a piece of land with a shape, some sort of specific shape that would allow you to identify it as one of these examples. We did that we didn't really like this and that we'd replaced it with a better definition. So we went ahead and deleted it and we decided to go with non-examples. I decided to list things that were found on earth but were not considered landforms because that helped them understand this definition better. So they said that landforms were not trees, air, rain, or those kinds of things. Students were allowed to come up with their own list of things that were not landforms. For the last example, I'm going to show you how you can use the definition first. So this would happen with something that students are less familiar with and would require some sort of investigation beforehand. So we could do some sort of investigation where students figure out what plants need in order to survive. And at the end of it, they would come up with this idea that plants use light, water, and air in order to make their own food. At the end of that process, I would use their own words to fill out the definition. So I'd be circulating around and listening to what they were talking about and trying to write down their language. Then I would tell them that photosynthesis is what we call this process. I would give them a part of speech and tell them that this is a noun, but I would also tell them that this is a process. And at some point, it probably makes sense for you to introduce that term process if it's unfamiliar to your students. Maybe in this case, we would decide to use a picture instead of an example because there aren't really many examples of this. Photosynthesis just is photosynthesis unless we wanted to do something like, say, uh, apple tree uses water and light in order to make fruit and to grow and those kinds of things. But that might be a little specific for students. The other thing that you can do is have them make a little mini model in this section, and that would entail drawing a picture of what they think is happening.
In this other section, it might be a good idea to have them break down the word into its parts. So photo means light and synthesis means to make. So this word essentially means to make with light that, and that might be helpful to students. Again, this is entirely dependent on your student needs. When I show teachers how to do this, I get a lot of questions and these are the most common. The first one I get is how are students able to interact with the terms in this way? A lot of them feel like their students wouldn't be capable of doing this. The most important thing about this approach is that you have to use an explore before explain strategy. So students are exploring the information before they're ever using this scientific vocabulary to express what they're doing. Students aren't going to know what photosynthesis is before they are given the opportunity to look at what plants do. The next question I get asked is how do I know where to start? So do I start with the term? Do I start with the definition? Do I start with examples? And that's entirely based on my students. And that means I need to spend some time walking around and listening to what my students are saying and see how they're explaining these phenomena to other students. So while they're doing an exploration activity, I'm going around and I'm asking them questions and I'm doing all kinds of things in order to understand what their level of understanding is. The final question I get asked a lot is, doesn't this take a really long time? And it does take a lot longer than maybe copying the definitions out of the textbook or just providing students with the definitions. But because it's interactive and because students have a, had a chance to explore the material before I'm giving them these terms, they're far more likely to understand what these terms mean and use it on their own. This certainly isn't the only way to do vocabulary in your classroom. This is just a strategy that I found to be really effective and actually have students use this academic language in the class. If you're not already subscribed, make sure to hit the subscribe button.